You're listening to South Niagara Conversations, a podcast presented by the South Niagara Chambers of Commerce, along with 105.1 The River and 101.1 More FM. Here are your hosts, Dolores Fabiano and Chris Burns. Well, good morning, and thanks to everyone who's joined us for our South Niagara Conversation series. For those of you who are tuning in from afar, we represent the communities of Fort Erie, Niagara Falls, Port Coburn, Wingfleet, Welland, and Pelham. We're located in Southern Ontario, a wonderful place to live, work, and play. This morning, Chris Burns, owner of 105.1 The River and 101.1 More FM, joins me as co-host. Good morning, Chris. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Dolores. Good to be Uh, here. Great, great. Good to see you. I uh, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, the Small Business Enterprise Center, City of Niagara Falls. They're great supporters of our chamber and of our local business community. Chris, this morning, we're going to discuss the trades, why we have such a shortage, and what we need to do right now to ensure a healthy trades workforce moving forward. We have a great panel joining us for the conversation, so let's get to it. Chris, who do we have joining us this morning? Dolores, this morning, uh, we welcome Marco Magazzini and Anthony Corazato from the Niagara Catholic District School Board, and also Rich DiPietro from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, 303 Niagara. Great to have you here this morning, gentlemen. And Marco, if I could start with you. Uh, At the high school level, are you seeing many students uh, exploring and interested in a career in the trades these days? I think the the interest is increasing, and I think it's increasing at a a rapid rate. I think with... uh, (laughs) with all the talk about it uh, in, in the media and, and around dinner tables at home. And uh, you, you seem to see provincial, municipal, and federal levels of government um, making a push uh, for what, you know, some are calling in some sectors a crisis uh, looming. We, we hosted a job fair, Anthony led a job fair uh, in St. Catharines the other day, and it kind of took me back that the average age of a bricklayer in Niagara is 61 years old. So. It's our, it's our mandate as, as Niagara Catholic District School Board to make sure that we're paying attention to that and uh, encourage students in our secondary, but also our elementary schools to start considering it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, Marco. I, th- there's not a year that, that goes by that I don't have friends, family, colleagues, uh, parents who say to me, can you talk to my kid and convince him to go into business or go to university? Um, they're thinking of taking a trade. But, you know, we really want them, want them to go in this direction. And I always say absolutely not. Like a, a trade is a great career path if that's where their interest lies. And what's ultimately going to happen is you're going to force them to go to university. <laughs> and year two or year three, um, they're going to, you know, change that path. So, no, I, I, I won't do that. But, you know, parents really need to change their mindset, right? And I think, and, and uh, Marco, you would have some good insight as well. I think, especially in Welland, you know, when we had all of the um, the plants, right? Like, so we had Atlas and John Deere and UCAR and just, you know, a, a whole bunch of places that people could could work. I think people were more likely to to encourage their kids to get into the trades because there were so many different places, obvious places that you could work. And as those all disappeared, I think parents became a little less eager to to encourage their kids to get into their field into that field or into the trades because they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't carve out you know what the path for them would be does that make sense are, are you are you it, seeing parents like is that part of the problem it does and I tried to reflect back um, <clears throat> from growing up in Welland and you're right um, you know I'm in my early fifties so growing up I, I think in my high school years if you landed a job at Atlas Steel or Page Hersey or Union Carbide or, or GM and St. Catharines, there was a sense of security to it. Right. Um, and, and, and there was a sense of, because many did 30, 35, some 40 years uh, with great benefits, uh, a great compensation package. So it was that level of security. I think where parents kind of, uh, parents my age now still have that that kind of mentality and that what we were brought up with, not realizing that our kids are probably going to have several jobs to fulfill that sense of security. So that that's a mindset shift as well. But we know jobs are out there. We know that lasting careers are out there in the trades um, that you can really enjoy. And Dolores, I did the same thing. I um, 
you know, wanted to get into a trade right out of Notre Dame uh, and was encouraged to go to university at the time, which I did. Um, and then, you know, came back and uh, did a trade. So it's, it's teaching, it is teaching parents. I'll just throw one little example that we, we shared at the, um, the mayor's round table. We have a student that we're kind of, all of a sudden she's become our, our poster child for Niagara Catholic. Um, she's excelling tremendously in our launch center. Um, has placed gold in our provincial brick lane, uh, has been offered uh, jobs already from industry. Um, and her mindset up until this year was always university. Hmm. And mom is a teacher, dad is a police officer. The first daughter is at university in continuing uh, teaching program to become a teacher. So it's safe. They understand that language. This daughter goes home and says, I'm not going to university anymore. And so it throws a twist into the mindset of parents, which causes concern because they don't know. Right. So that's our job too, actually, I think as, as, as a school board, but also as I think it lies on chambers of commerce and industry to, to change that mindset of parents as well, that, it, that it's okay if your son or daughter uh, does walk out of our schools and into a trade. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Rich, I want to get you into, involved in the conversation. What, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? Where, where are the jobs at? Um, you know, I, I, I want to reflect back on, on what Marco said, and, and I experienced the same situation back when I was in high school, um, pushed to get to the university. And uh, I obviously opted into uh, moving into the trades. And there is a, a tremendous amount of work for the tradespeople uh, here in Ontario right now. Uh, they've been screaming shortages of trades for 25, 30 years. Uh, I really haven't seen it personally until most recent years now. And, uh, and, and uh, I, I agree, it's, for some trades, it, it is at crisis point. I was, you know, bricklayers, uh, boilermakers, uh, sheet metal, to name a few, are, are really screaming to get to individuals into those trades. Um, with uh, electrical, I'm seeing um, a shortage right now, especially within some of the sectors within the electrical industry. Um, you know, kind of before we, we started here talking about the, the residential boom within the Niagara region, um, we don't have enough residential wiremen uh, to, to, to build these homes. And uh, as much as we're trying to attract uh, new individuals uh, from the schools uh, to get them into the trades, uh, we still are really seeking out a lot of experienced residential uh, tradespeople as, as, as well, licensed individuals. Uh, so I see a, a big push for, for residential wiremen and uh, uh, another portion of our trade, uh, the communications and low voltage sector, uh, a huge demand right now um, within uh, as technology evolves um, and there is a trade designation. It's a 631A network cabling specialist. Um, I've actually been working uh, this past year on a provincial initiative uh, through the provincial government, uh, through the Skills Development Fund uh, funding to prepare uh, for the future of, of, of the 631A network cabling specialist. Um, technology is changing. The electrical trade is changing. So uh, th there is a lot of need um, within the trades right now. And I'm, I'm excited to hear that the schools are continuing this message. I know it hasn't just started recently. But uh, I think the school systems need to continue to push, and it's fantastic that the, the commerce are, are recognizing that as well. Anthony, are, are you guys um, uh, connected with the different trade associations so that as, as a school board that, that is encouraging kids to get into the trades, you can direct them into the trades that have the best uh, opportunities for them? Are, are, are you guys making that connection? Yeah, so we're very lucky to have uh, strong partnerships with uh, the Niagara Industrial Association and mm -hmm. also the Niagara Home Builders Association. Mark had mentioned we just uh, presented a job fair with over uh, 300 students that uh, were bussed in. We had over 40 uh, organizations that uh, were actively uh, seeking to hire uh, part-time, full-time, and uh, you know post-secondary. Uh, and in one of the sessions, I organized two sessions. We organized two sessions. And one of them was exactly what we're talking about. So we were able to have uh, Thorold Economic, uh, Niagara Economic, Niagara Home Builders Association, and the Niagara Industrial Association provide uh, employment, understanding the trends and gaps that our students can benefit uh, within our region. 
Um, so as we said, there's, there's lots of opportunities within our region, but again, it's that education to know that there is real jobs happening, openings, dire needs, like we said, crises of, of, uh, of employment uh, gaps that our, our students need to be able to understand. So we are lucky enough that we have, uh, you know, a great partnership with those two associations. Both of those, uh, you know, Trek McShane and, and Aaron Tisdale were, were incredibly uh, supportive and, and very generous with their time and also um, connecting with students. They, we had lots of students that, that came up and just started peppering them with questions. And, and, if, and I think that's what, you know, we as, as a community, both education and industry, if we keep educating and understand, uh, helping them understand what the positions that there are available within our region, you know, we want to see our, 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 our students, we want to see our children stay close to us. Some of us, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Some of us, you know, would, wouldn't mind if they left the cross country, <laughs> but I'm sure the majority of us would like to, to have our family close to us. And, um, you know, the perception, again, you guys, you know, it was mentioned before, factories were shut down, industry is, is, is leaving Niagara. But the reality is, Niagara is booming. Like Rich just said, there's lots of residential, there's lots of industrial, there's lots of manufacturing happening. It's just in a different concept. Like as opposed to that 5,000 person plant, we now have 500 smaller plants that are doing 15 or 20 mm -hmm. positions. So as the associations and as Chambers of Commerce, which you're doing such a great job, uh, Dolores, is getting everybody together to promote as one. So it's not just that one main uh, factory or company that's doing it. It's all of us coming together to be able to promote and, and advertise what is, what is happening here in the, uh, in the region and in certain municipalities. So yes, we are, we are connecting with that. And uh, just to, again, to touch base for parent education, a lot of the uh, positive feedback we received from the both associations, uh, we, we called, I called it uh, what's happening in Niagara. Um, and so the what's happening in Niagara session really opened up eyes for students that, again, the periphery, they hear of these things and, oh, it might be happening. But to hear it from industry partners, uh, I'm sure just like parents, you know, you may say to your, your child something three times, but if someone else says it, the exact same message, it, it, for some reason, there has more weight to it. And so that's why it's really important for us as educators to connect with industry partners so that the message that they're sending saying that we are hiring, we are hiring and this is what we're looking for. And we want to be able to have you in our businesses, in our corporations, help us grow our businesses because Niagara, you know, Niagara is booming. The population is, is increasing and uh, things are looking up. So, uh, you know, these, these opportunities that we have discussions uh, also have to connect again to what uh, Marco and yourself had mentioned parents, like Richard said, you know, changing the perception of the trades and of skilled trades, uh, although it's, uh, you know, my dad, I grew up, my dad was a senior electrician for CN and, um, you know, I didn't see a repairman in my house uh, the entire time I, I lived, I lived at home and I was always amazed at what he could do um, and what he was able to accomplish. And, you know, that's, that's intelligence, right? So not only was it intelligent, but he was also able to provide for, you know, his family and, uh, and for all of us. So, changing the mindset, which is also, if I can just touch base, uh, which is also the mindset of now uh, the, the, uh, the province. So we, the province just did a, a major rehaul and a restudy of what their uh, OEAP, Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program looks like, how it is promoted and how it is um, uh, put forth. And one of the major stumbling blocks was the perception of trades in society. Mm -hmm. So it, it, start, it starts with us, it starts from the ground up and making all of us realize the importance of that's who, that's who builds and, and gives us infrastructure and, and everything. So yeah. uh, yes, it's really, really important. I always say, if you have a trade, you're, you're really set for life. And, and I always go back to a story. Um, so, so years ago, um, when Atlas Steel's, Marco, you'll remember, closed, our Chamber of Commerce hosted a... Um, um, a, a kind of a trade show uh, that coincided with the last shift of Atlas Steels. And the trade show was really to talk to, to people who had been displaced, lost their jobs, about, you know, um, starting up businesses. We, we have a um, benefits program for members. And so we were looking at how we could help them uh, access benefits. And also for a lot of them, they needed their GED. 
And so we worked with a local uh, credit union to bring in the GED program to, to Welland so that they could take the program in Welland instead of having to go to Hamilton. And um, we also set up a loan program to um, help them pay for it. We talked to just about everybody who came through the door. We had our entire board and all of our, our staff out there. And we really just wanted to get some feedback. And, and it was interesting because a lot of people were already doing stuff on the side that they could that they could um, build a business around, and some did. But the one person who, who really sticks out in my mind, um, he, he was a bricklayer. He had worked at Atlas his entire career. His dad had worked there. His grandfather had worked there. And um, I, I had a long conversation with him. He ended up becoming a member of the chamber. A couple of years later, he came into the office to renew his membership. And I happened to be out front and started chatting with him and said, you know, how's it going? How's, how's life? You know, what have you been up to? And he said, life has never been better. He said, I, you know, thought I had it made when I was working at, at the Atlas, but I didn't know what I didn't know. He goes, um, there is a building boom happening in Niagara Falls at the time we were building the new casino. And, and there was a couple of other things, hotels going up. And he said, I have as much work as I want, but now I'm in control. He says, so, so for the past two years, I've gone to Florida for uh, four weeks. Um, and I just don't take any jobs at that time. And I have the best life ever because it's on, on my terms. And that's always stuck with me because, you know, when I talked to him the first time at the trade show, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. And I remember saying to him, you know, buddy, you've got to trade. You're, you're going to be fine. Like you're going to be okay because, you know, there's always a need for a bricklayer. And uh, it really turned out to be true. And, and uh, it just makes me feel so good that he, he, you know, ended up being better than okay. And I think it's important that, that kids and their parents understand it's not just, you know, a career path. It's a very uh, lucrative career path. Like you can have a great life, uh, make really great money and, um, and, and, and enjoy all of the things that, that come with that. If you take that, that pathway, right. That's, that's part of, of the message that we have to get out there. I think. It's a great story, Dolores. Um, you know, one of the questions I had for, you know, for, for all of you is, you know, what really is the root behind, uh, you know, these shortages? Is it perception? Um, what, what's really causing this and, and, and how do we solve it? Because, uh, you know, this is an ongoing issue. It's not the first year that this has cropped up. Uh, I'd really appreciate, uh, you know, your views, uh, all three of you. If, uh, if I could start and, uh, you know, Marco and Richie have uh, the industry experience as well. So, so part of my portfolio is, uh, is, is also cooperative education. And, uh, you know, at, at the mayor's round table with, uh, with the industry partners and also with the, the people that we've spoken to thus far, uh, getting students early to understand the joy and the satisfaction and the option, the pathway that they can, uh, that is open to them. Rich, you say, you know, we, this has been a problem. Uh, Chris, you said this is a problem, um, you know, earlier before. And well, that's because 10 years ago, did we do the right job that we're in the job that we're in the situation we are now 10 years later? So if, you know, in the past, it has been a grade 10, grade 11 focus. Let's talk about pathways right now. But, and that's where industry and education need to connect more and understand where that is. In grade 10, grade 11, it, it's, it's a little late because they may have already understood where they're going or taking courses or not having the experience that they have early. So what one of our um, one of the things that we do and we're going to continue to do is get them earlier to 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 capture their imagination when they're in that five, six, seven, understanding that what this really is and what the value of you could have later on. And then the, the last thing I want to touch on is uh, so the cooperative education. It's really important, I think, as an you know, as experiential learning consultant that they need to experience what that job means and what that is. So it's, it's, and we're very, very fortunate to have, you know, a lot of great community partners for, for our students to, to participate in uh, authentic learning experiences and, and cooperative education opportunities. But the more, uh, the more of those connections we can make and the more ways that we can get students at workplaces to understand the value, satisfaction, and, uh, and future that they have in, in the trades and skilled trades and in, in all of our workspaces, 
would certainly uh, benefit, I think, uh, moving forward. I, I couldn't agree more, Anthony, with you when you, you talk about by the time they're hitting, you know, grade 11, uh, it's too late. It really does uh, have to start a lot earlier than that. Um, you know, most people don't know there's uh, 144 trades that are governed uh, under the newly formed Skills Trades Ontario, uh, 23 of them being compulsory, uh, 121 of them being voluntary trades. Uh, but, you know, education and uh, showcasing the different trades to these younger individuals uh, is key to getting them interested at an earlier age and continuing to push that these are gratifying jobs. You know, tradespeople come home at the end of the day and realize or feel a sense of accomplishment that they're helping build the communities that we live in, the communities that their children are going to be a part of for years to come. So um, these are rewarding jobs, and, and, and it, it, it's great to see um, even, even the government, both uh, provincially and federally, uh, continue to push that those message and uh, you know Monty McNaughton. How many times have you heard him say you have a a, a trade uh, a trade you have a job for life, right? The, this messaging is, is is now finally coming from all avenues, and uh, I hope that that continues. And and hopefully the uh, you know even the elementary schools uh, start pushing it at a much younger age um, to these individuals. So by the time they hit you know grade 10, 11, 12, um, they're already thinking. I'd like to get into the trades. I'd like to work with my my hands. I'd like to build my community. Okay, cool. Marco, what are your thoughts? Anything to add? I, I shared this at the Mayor Campion's roundtable, and and I think it it's something that has to happen. Like you're, you're right. This this conversation has been going on for years. Uh, I think the implementation of the College of Trades was to try to kind of resolve that, to or to look into that when um, you know. My background is an electrician. I was self-employed. And at the time there was, I, I, I think uh, Rich would attest to this, a lot of people doing uh, work, but not following through an apprenticeship or completing their CFQ. So there, there, there was a big pocket that existed that kind of skewed data at the time as well. I think we've caught up to that. I don't know if we, we fully caught up to it, but, but it's, uh, there's like a lull in society where it's like, yeah, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Um, and, and you hear that with, with other sectors other than trades. But the one thing that for us as school systems, whether it's Niagara Catholic or, or district school board or, or the French Catholic or public boards, we need industry and chambers of commerce and IBEWs and, 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 and we need conversations to happen with our trustees. Um, and, and, you know, we said that at, uh, at the round table that if a contractor or, or a developer runs into a problem with rezoning or a building permit or an application, the first thing they do is pick up and call their mayor or, or call a, a, a member of council to try to, to try to resolve it. Yet, yet we're all talking about a crisis in employment replacement in skilled trades. And those, those phones are not ringing uh, from industry, calling our trustees saying, okay, what are you doing in elementary schools? Like, you know, I, I hate to say it, we, we've removed. We used to have a, a kind of a tech program to introduce kids, both boards, uh, district school board and Niagara Catholic, that grade sevens and eights participated in. Those were removed. And we need, we need industry, we need business, and we need agencies and municipalities. Uh, and that's our, our next meeting today, Anthony, is I used to, to try to host one of those where our trustees are hearing exactly what this podcast is talking about. Because ultimately, they're the decision makers of what happens within our buildings. Um, and that, that conversation has to take place and I don't think it has yet. So mm. it's, it's a major step forward for us. Do you have an idea for a small business? Maybe you're trying to grow a business that you've already started. Whatever the case, the Niagara Falls Small Business Enterprise Center is a community service that is here to help. Offering entrepreneurs the tools to start and grow their businesses, the Small Business Enterprise Center is your one stop for free business information and advice. Serving Niagara Falls and South Niagara, learn more about how we can help you and your business succeed at niagarafalls.ca slash SBEC. That's, that's such a fantastic point. And I, I'm making notes because we have a, mini, a municipal election happening in the fall. And, and you're so right. Like there's often not a lot of questions for the trustees. So 
that's a fantastic point. Um, and, and we'll follow up on that. Um, I, I would like to know what, so if someone uh, decides, okay, I'm going to pursue um, a trade, how does that work? Like, do, do they, do they start working with an employer? Do they go to Niagara college? Do they, what, what, what are the steps? Like how, how do they get that, that trade? Uh, grade eight is a big year because you're, you're picking, you're selecting your courses. We start a little bit earlier with some uh, career dialogue with grade sevens. Grade eight's the big year when you're picking your secondary courses. Um, and you try to, so the secondary schools work closely with elementary schools to find out what pathway this, you know, the boy or girl has kind of in the back of their mind. Course selections are key. To, to navigate and to guide you to get into, you know, that potential pathway that you want. Grade 10 is the other big year. I think it's going back 14 or 15 years now where the Ministry of Education had implemented a specialist high skills major program. The specialist high skills major program was basically a roundtable with Ministry of Education and industry and business to say, okay, how, how do we kind of get our, our students uh, prepackaged before they leave uh, high school and that specialist high skills major now. So if I'm a, a student coming out of Northern Ames saying I want to get into construction, I'm in grade 10. Mm -hmm. Our guidance counselors, you know, their role is to uh, get you into one of these specialist high skills major programs. At that point, Dolores, you're, you're kind of mandated what courses you're going to take. So you're going to take uh, four credits in construction. Okay. Uh, you're going to take your, your math and what's hard is um, and, and, and Rich could, could certainly speak to this, is, is telling our students, but more importantly, even our guidance counselors, because there's an awareness piece that you will not get an apprenticeship with IBEW without your grade 12 sign. Yet, you can in a non-union shop. So we, we have to make sure that those pieces, we don't want our kids leaving here without grade 12 signs, because we want both options available For sure. to students. And so you really do have to be on your game, but being on our game is with industry by our side. We've worked close with in the past with IBEW. They've uh, graciously sponsored a couple of awards. I think it was a St. Paul high school uh, for students getting into an electrical apprenticeship. So it's that Dolores, it's being aggressive. Um, our launch center, which we would, you know, uh, definitely want to host. If you ever get back to your business after five events, yeah. Uh, yeah. our launch center at the Seaway mall is, Ooh. is just that it's, it's, it's zoned in on trades, but also engineering and robotics program. And um, we have industry partners there that work closely with us. Um, so it's, it's those kind of aggressive pieces that we, ha we have to stay on uh, as, as students journey from elementary to secondary and then when they leave us. I'm going to date myself, but when I was in, el in elementary school, we had shop. So you, you would go and you could, you know, I, I, my parents still have the bookends that I made. Right. Yeah. They weren't Quality very, work. very nice. Quality work, Dolores. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but they were pretty proud. Um, and we took cooking and yep. I, macrame, um, all That's kinds right. of stuff. Yeah. It yeah. Is, is, I'm sure it's not called shop anymore, but, but is there a program like that for, for elementary school to get a, a, a taste of some of uh, those, those things? Yeah. Unfortunately, no. Uh, both oh. boards... Uh, for various reasons that have removed those. So what, what really has to start happening here is, is a few things. I think conversations with trustees at a, at a grassroots level. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I also think it's time for industry leaders and union leaders to start saying to the province, why are some of these courses not compulsory in high school? You have to remember, right now is kind of silly season for all school boards across the province. You're, you're, you're doing your enrollment numbers, and you're trying to staff for the incoming year. I can't collapse English, math, science, French. I, I can't collapse those courses. They're, they're compulsory courses. Right. A construction class is not a compulsory course, right? Uh, uh, like, and I'm not, but, it, but it's time that you can't keep continuing this conversation like Chris said earlier and not make some dramatic changes from a ministry perspective to say, and I, and I think the government is right now. They are. They are changing some things and they are, you know, insisting on STEM being infused in curriculum, the science, technology, uh, engineering and math. So there's there's slow steps, but some of these courses at some point, I hope before uh, I exit, 
that they're actually mandatory that kids, even for a basic skill set, like, yeah. great, you want to go into to become the next doctor? That's great, but you need to know how to hang a picture on the wall too. So <laughs> that's, that's, a, right. that's a great, that's a great point. So, you know, how far in advance are we looking? Because, you know, whilst there'll always be a need for an electrician and a bricklayer, um, what, what are some of the, the new trades that are, are on the horizon that might excite, you know, um, a young person in grade four, five or six? Um, you know, they're all on the Internet these days. They're all searching. They, they perhaps come with more knowledge than uh, previous generations, not necessarily always the right knowledge. <laughs> but, um, you know, w- what are some of the, the, the new trends out there that, that potentially you could get these students excited about? The, the one where we're seeing a lot of success, we've been approved for an aviation program. We're in our second year. Um, and we have a partnership with the Welland, Port Coburn, Pelham Airport uh, and the, uh, the Eagle Squadron there. We actually use their building Monday to Friday. There's a big uptake uh, in that. And we know that area, I think, I think in the aviation industry, they may even use the word crisis uh, that's looming. We've, we've been having conversations, Chris, with, with you know, organizations like the Seafarers Union in, in, in the marine industry. The, the, again, I, I'm going to use the word crisis that, that's coming up in there. And until we can, we have to continue those conversations that I know we've never had in the past. We probably didn't even realize there was a seafarers union because you can't not have those conversations. And then this, you know, the alternate conversation is, well, you know, everything's, all this shipping is getting contracted out to uh, shipping businesses in Asia or Pakistan or India. They are. If we don't get our act together to say we, we have to replenish our labor pool in order to sustain our own companies that are here. So it's a big undertaking, but we can't do it alone. Mm-hmm. And, and can I just put a, a little plug in there for ceramic tile uh, installers? Because still looking for one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris, I just had to get that in there. <laughs> and if, I, if, I can just, if I can just piggyback on that, Marco. So there is uh, the, the Marine Tech, Maritech, is, there is a conference next, uh, next Thursday that they're hosting. And uh, so their stat is that they're, they're going to be looking for, the, the estimate is 19,000 new jobs in the next 10 years. That's, that's, that's the stat from uh, Canadian Marine Industry Foundation that I had to read three times. Uh, that's just one of the foundations. So like, again, Marco mentioned the Seafarers Union. The other one, Chris, that, uh, that is, is really, you know, to get that new you know, youthful look, even though we need traditional uh, skills like uh, uh, that Richard said, the information communications technology sector is uh, also, uh, you know, digital computer applications, you know, all the stuff that uh, you know, one of the uh, session people that we had was a young entrepreneur who's 18 years old. Uh, he started editing Fortnite videos. Uh, you know, ma- he was being made fun of by his friend. And he, this is part of his presentation. He was being made fun of by his friends and uh, just kept on doing what he wanted to do. And now he's uh, incredibly successful real estate marketing, social media superstar. Mm-hmm. Right. So, again, there are things that there are changing the way business is being done, which we all understand. Uh, but then there's also booming fields, like you said, Chris, that that also need to be uh, promoted and, and expected. And but that also needs the technical side, right? So those mm-hmm. trades, elect, um, uh, you know, electrical engineering and 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 those those aspects of someone putting that board together uh, is is incredibly exciting. And and the green industries. So if we think of, of the trades that have to go into the green industries, um, we have, you know, we're very lucky to have uh, Inyo Waukesha uh, here in Welland and, and they're helping, you know, their engines are helping pump green uh, uh, energy throughout, you know, the world and, and throughout Canada. So even having the traditional trade in a non-traditional format or a non-traditional sector also is exciting. Like, how do I apply that to something new and innovative? And that's what we all, you know, we all strive for. And that's what we all promote for our, our, ourselves and our, our students and, and the future. But how do we do that in a, more, a non-conventional way? So right. that's, that's the exciting part of, uh, of, these, of, the, of the new things. And, and hopefully, again, 
spark an interest in a new generation of, uh, you know, it's, it's not the internal combustion engine mechanic now. It's now my nephew, uh, licensed mechanic, and uh, he, you know, moved around four or five shops. And now he's working at a, a high-end electrical, um, um, green energy electrical, I think the name right, green energy electrical mechanical shop. Uh, strictly for, you know, e-vehicles. And there's, you know, there's not, there's, there's not a lot of wrenches to be found. Right. Uh, but yet he's still a mechanic. So that's, that still is going on in a non-traditional innovative sector. So I, I, I'm just curious if, if um, a young person hasn't followed that path uh, through high school, get through high school, maybe they go to university for a year or two um, and then decide, no, not for me. I do want to get into the trades. Is it too late for them? Can, can they still, can they still get into a trade? And, and what would that pathway look like? It, it's, it's absolutely uh, possible. And, and um, I sat actually on our joint apprenticeship committee for, for nine years. Um, and I've been through uh, many of intakes of uh, when we were, you know, having new intakes for brand new apprentices looking to get into the trade. And uh, compared to uh, the first intake I was a part of in, I think, 2011, compared to, you know, 2018, um, the bulk of our applicants were individuals that have already attempted, uh, you know, a college or university uh, in a different, uh, a different field and have realized that it's not for them mm -hmm. and have come back. Um, there was fewer young people coming out of high school than uh, than people that uh, were coming from the universities. I just wanted to, to touch on um, uh, what Marco had mentioned earlier about uh, with the IBW uh, requiring a grade 12 science. We do require a grade 12 and a grade 12 college or university math. Uh, we don't require a grade 12 science. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're absolutely right that the ministry standards, and, <clears throat> and I, I'd like to see it changed, um, to become an electrician, you actually only need a grade 10. Um, I think it should be pushed up uh, without it uh, having that grade 12 or that grade 12 uh, and that grade 12 college university math and physics is, a, is, a, is an added bonus as well. That, that individual, is, you're basically setting them up um, for failure because they're going to have uh, trouble uh, achieving their license. Um, the electrical program is 9,000 hours, uh, three terms of trade school, uh, a basic, intermediate, and advanced, and it's very uh, math heavy. And uh, if they don't have that grade 12 and that grade 12 math, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very challenging for them to get through that uh, trade school and then ultimately write their certificate of qualification and become licensed. Um, so <clears throat> that, and I think a part, a part of the reason we've seen, and I, I'm going to speak specifically to the electrical um, there was a lot of people that I've seen uh, divert out of the trade over the last decade that have been kind of in, a, in the role of uh, membership development uh, because they weren't getting that formal apprenticeship. They weren't getting the, having the ability to go to trade school and they got discouraged. They got discouraged and, and, wanna, and, and ultimately left the field. Making sure that the uh, students, uh, you know, in the high schools understand how the apprenticeship program works and the importance of having a formal apprenticeship, whether it's a compulsory trade or a voluntary trade, and ultimately getting a trade license, in my, in my eyes, is extremely important. Um, compulsory trades, uh, like electrical, like plumbing, you have to be a licensed journey person or a registered apprentice to work in that craft. Uh, an, uh, a voluntary trade uh, like carpentry, you don't need to be a, a registered apprentice or a licensed carpenter to frame houses. But I would encourage at the, at the early levels, if you are getting into the trade, whether it's compulsory or non-compulsory, get that trade license. It's gonna add a, a, a safety component, uh, an educational component on your craft, but having that ticket uh, means something and is going to open up more opportunities down the, ro uh, down the road. So I hope that's getting pushed uh, at the students, understanding the apprenticeship program and, and, and making sure that they're fulfilling and getting that uh, trade license at the end of the day. If I can just uh, piggyback on, on that, Rick. So in, on the heels of uh, the provincial review that was done, and I mentioned about the perception, 
one of also the barriers that they and themselves under, understood was the lack of clear communication of apprenticeship pathways. So the ministry themselves understood that they were very convoluted in promoting and, and explaining how you go about the pathway for apprenticeship and, and eventually journey person and, and ticketing. Um, and so they are currently redesigning now with Skill Trades Ontario and MTLSD. They are uh, really redesigning how they're doing it because it is, Dolores, you had mentioned, it is uh, sporadic. So you go from one to the other and, and it's not as clear cut as I graduate, I apply to college or university, I, I finish in four years and that's done. So there is a process and there is a journey that again, Rich, we are doing in conjunction with you know, ministry partners to make sure that that is explained to the students, also the parents, but also Rich, the other thing too, uh, employers themselves as a co-op and as, as you know, special high skills major, some of the employers also, uh, because I guess the confusion of the, the, the apprenticeship pathway, when they, need, when they wanna sign that registered trade agreement or registered training agreement, they, they also have a, a misunderstanding and, a mis, and, a, and they're not clear on, oh, if am I signing this apprentice, do I have to take him or her throughout their entire journey person, throughout their entire 9,000 hours? So again, everybody needs to be re-educated and re-reviewed on the information that, that uh, for possible pathway uh, apprenticeship completion. Good helpful advice. So here's a question. What, um, what are you hearing about uh, strategies that companies are implementing to, to try and attract and more importantly, retain talent. Uh, I, I think both Marco and Rich earlier mentioned about the drift of people leaving uh, various industries, but what, what, what do companies need to be doing in 2022 to not only attract uh, you know, qualified workers, but keep them? From what I see, uh... Companies need to continue to uh, enroll these individuals into apprenticeships, um, guide them through the education side of it, um, and ultimately, uh, with with you know where inflation is today, which is a big word that continues to fly around, uh, proper compensation packages. Um, it's getting tougher and tougher for people to provide for themselves and their families, and uh, and, and compensation not necessarily the number one motivator. Uh, it's definitely a factor uh, on retaining uh, core employees uh, within companies. If and uh, Rich as well, I was I, I was speaking to a, a corporation this week, and sometimes the industry is kind of shot themselves in the foot because now we have such an efficiency model um, that we want. What some companies need is they want someone now that's already trained that's work ready and that's work capable. Whereas we look at 40 years ago, 50 years ago, there'd be a lot of people that just came in with no skill, but a willingness to work. And the company themselves invested, they understood that if they wanted to have somebody take over, then they need to invest in that person for the long term. So I think industry also has to have a bit of a mindset change to say, well, what's the reality of me really getting a qualified, understood, mature, ready to go uh, tradesperson or any any employee, that's probably not a, a, that's probably not reality. So they themselves have to change and say, okay, well, maybe we have to, like you said, Rich, support that person, that education, you know, that drift away. Well, if they weren't, if they don't feel supported, then they feel lost, they don't feel valued, and then they don't continue. So it has to be a little bit of a give and take with both industry has to take a chance and yes, it might hurt the bottom line, but that bottom line, is it better for a one year investment or a two year investment or to understand the 10 year dividends that you're going to get by training and supporting that, that individual. I agree. Well, the flip side of that is, and, and I'm sure Rich, you hear this, um, you know, I'm a contractor and I've invested 9,000 hours of training between school and on the job training. And in a market like today, I can start my own company and walk away from it. So, 
it, it, it's, it's a balancing act too for owners and businesses to, I think the compensation piece is a big factor because I think there's a lot of people exploiting that a bit, but, but it is a, it is a balancing act because I, I remember being self-employed. It's hard. You put a lot of time and effort into someone and um, they walk away and it, it, it creates a big void in, in the organization. It's, it's not easy. One, one thing that came out from the mayor's uh, talk, uh, there were a couple of companies there that are really pushing in-house training, which I thought was interesting. Um, I know, I know IBW does it. I know, I know it's always been a practice of yours. Um, I don't know that it's been a practice for non-union a lot of, of a continual in-house training. So I, I found that interesting, which I think is a really good thing. There, there's, there's no doubt uh, that not only the IBW, but a, a lot of the building trades unions invest millions, millions of dollars uh, in training, uh, upgrading, uh, upskilling their, their members, safety training, um, and, you know, unfortunately, it, it doesn't happen uh, in the non-union. And, and that is why, I mean, the IBW um, retention is, is, is extremely high. Um, you know, uh, there was studies done by the Ontario Construction Secretary, the Secretary a few years, you know, quite a few years back on uh, apprentices, um, you know. And, and, and those days, I mean, it was our retention for apprentice completions uh, were well above 90%. Where, where the non-union was was falling under 50% on completion of apprenticeships. And that was, you know, goes back to my earlier comments that, um, you know, I can't, I can't tell you how many individuals I've talked to working uh, with, with a non-union contractor over the last decade that wasn't registered, that wasn't in a formal apprenticeship, that had put in, I'm talking not one year, I'm talking five years without having that formal apprenticeship, um, and yes, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's illegal that, you know, we are a compulsory trade. You're either a certified journey person or a registered apprentice, but it has been rampant. Um, I myself uh, started with an on-union contractor and, uh, and worked as an unregistered apprentice. I didn't know I was doing something illegal at the time. You know, I mean, the internet wasn't as, uh, as uh, accessible as it is today. I didn't, I didn't know and I wasn't being told uh, by my employer, but uh, luckily I, I stuck with it. Um, and I did end up uh, joining the IBW and getting that formal apprenticeship, completing my formal apprenticeship with the IBW and obviously becoming a, a licensed journey person. So, I mean, I, I look back at my own scenario and think, you know, I, I am fortunate, but there, there's been hundreds, if not thousands of people that, that, you know, went a year two, five without getting that apprenticeship and just said, that's enough. I'm leaving and I'm going to find another career path. So um, that's, you know, going back to previous comment, that's where it's important that these uh, young individuals that are coming out of high school understand the uh, apprenticeship program and the importance of getting signed on day one, not year five, um, and making sure that they're going to be retaining into that trade. Great point, Rich. And well, look, Anthony, uh, Marco and Rich, thank you so much. Uh, some really interesting insights here this morning. Um, and, and I think that will be you know, we'll look at things moving forward here and, and, and hopefully uh, we're going to see more people, uh, you know, come into trades because as someone pointed out at the beginning of this call, you know, the average age of a bricklayer is, uh, is, is 60. Um, and, and you look through the various other trades and, and it's certainly up there. Uh, if you go onto a building site these days and you look at uh, the amount of gray hair that's, uh, you know, that's on those sites. Um, it really is very concerning for the future if we can't entice uh, young people to, uh, to go into these trades. So thank you so much for your comments and insights today. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. Dolores, thank you. Uh, what have we got planned for next week? Yeah, you can hear my dog barking. Of course, we couldn't get through the podcast without her barking. So sorry about that. Uh, thanks for the conversation today. I learned so much. Next week, we're going to take a break and then we'll be back with our final episode of the season. Um, so we look forward to that. To all of our listeners, send us the topics that you're talking about because we want to talk about them too. Thanks again for tuning in and have yourselves a wonderful day.